one thing that this dovetails with is, is the idea of, of comets. As I mentioned, the moon that was supposed to be wrong. Temple 1 was, was the comet that they struck. They did some other experiments mm. uh, uh, last year when they so-called bombed the moon. And I don't know if... Were, were you guys watching that too? Do you remember what that... What happened there? Yes, I made no predictions about that because I didn't expect there would be anything. Uh, Why not? Why not in this case? <coughs> well, I was unsure they would even see uh, where they hit. As it turned out, that was correct, but it wasn't much of a prediction to make. Um, uh, nothing like with the comet, because the comet is a highly charged body compared to its surroundings. The uh, moon uh, and the spacecraft are not sufficiently different in charge uh, because they're in the same part in the solar system and the spacecraft doesn't travel all that fast compared with the moon or its approach velocity to the moon was uh, relatively slow whereas uh, the uh, comet and the projectile hit at a, a colossal speed. So it, there are a number of factors which I decided it was better just to keep out of it. <laughs> Although I was asked. <laughs> <laughs> you were, okay, I reckon that. Uh, in terms of comets then, uh, do they, do they carry, if you will, then a, a higher function? Do do they help to um, create discharge between between bodies? As as I mentioned before, we have these interesting things happening. For instance, many people have been watching the sun. The Soho satellites uh, take excellent yes. pictures of of the sun, and and we can see now and then uh, comets coming by. And in some cases, to me, as just as a layman's observer, I it's almost like the the sun is reaching out to these bodies sometimes with with flares. Yes. It's, it's like it's a discharge, and a, if you will, and a relationship between comets and, and the sun. Tell us about that, Wolf. Yes, uh, that's the kind of thing you would expect uh, with the electric model, because um, the comet is uh, moving in the sun's uh, circuit, if you like, in its uh, plasma environment. And therefore, there were, and also the uh, electrical influence of a comet extends far beyond this tiny little piece of rock which is the comet nucleus, uh, so that, uh, yes, you would expect uh, discharge activity uh, when a, a comet, a sun-grazing comet, uh, is um, photographed by SOHO. And this appears to be what, what's happened on a couple of occasions. So that, that fits with the model. Uh, it's not unexpected. Do you think that this is what happened if we go back to the, the, the ancient world? Where still, though, when humans were around, obviously, because this connects with mm. uh, the mythological themes as well. But is, is, is that a minor representation of what might have happened in the ancient world, considering the, uh, the discharge between bigger, uh, and in many cases, than planetary bodies, that when, when, when whatever happened yes. there, we don't know what, what actually happened if we had a, an external body coming in from outside of the solar system or something just was upset in our system, which meant that all these planets became, um, you, you know, they, they set in a different order compared to how they were in the ancient mm. world. Uh, mm. Tell us about that, Wall. I was uh, fascinated by the, uh, I think it was only about one or two pages, uh, article by Velikovsky on Saturn as uh, being the son of night, he called it. <clears throat> and he uh, mentions that the uh, Earth had uh, two suns shining in the sky at one point. And this uh, really interested me because there are Aboriginal legends here too of when there were two suns, uh, one, you know, a large sun and a lesser sun. And um, one of the suns, the lesser sun, hid in a hollow log. Now, that doesn't make much sense uh, on the face of it. However, uh, the, we've been able to piece together fairly well what the activity was um, both inside and outside the solar system at the time when uh, these catastrophes took place. And um, in the case of uh, what we call proto-Saturn, uh, the body we see today is just a, a, a dim remnant of uh, its former glory. Um, Proto-Saturn was a, a dwarf star, you know, a brown dwarf you might call it. And uh, when it encountered the sun, because uh, and this, is, this is where I think uh, real science of the electric universe will make uh, science fiction pale into insignificance, the Earth was a satellite of Proto-Saturn, not of the sun. We're not here. We were not born here. And that takes a bit of getting around, mm -hmm. getting your mind around. Mm -hmm. 
uh, both uh, Mars, Earth and Venus were originally satellites of uh, proto-Saturn as a brown dwarf star. And uh, when uh, proto-Saturn encountered the sun's electrical environment, because each star has this electrical environment enclosed in a, a, um, a cell, like a, an egg almost, and that cell is a plasma cell, a plasma sheath, and uh, the electric field of the star is contained within that sheath. Uh, beyond that sheath, uh, you have the electric field of the galaxy. Now, when two stars come close to, together, the two sheaths are the first things that touch. And when that happens, for the first time, the two stars know of each other's presence electrically. They would have known gravitationally long before, but because the gravity, as I said before, penetrates these plasma cells and goes straight through as if it's not there. Mm -hmm. When they saw each other electrically, all of a sudden the brown dwarf, uh, its voltage was much lower than that of the sun. And so the sun took away its power, if you like, and, this, and instead of being a brown dwarf, it became a giant uh, stellar-sized comet. <laughs> now, that's almost mind-boggling. And uh, the Earth and Venus were enveloped in the uh, the sheath, the plasma sheath of that uh, comet tail, which is Proto-Saturn. And uh, from the Earth's perspective, when it uh, was sort of tailing along in this uh, comet tail, it looked as though this minor sun had been uh, swallowed at the top of a hollow log. <laughs> <laughs> and so the uh, Aboriginal legends uh, from Australia um, match this picture that we'd already um, uh, pieced together, Dave Talbot and uh, Duario Cardona uh, had pieced together from Velikovsky's hint all those years ago in the 1970s. <laughs> because as far as I've heard, the, the, um, the binary star systems are, are allegedly more common out there than than, uh, yes. than regular mono star systems. That's right. Yeah. Yes, yes. And the other thing is too that uh, when uh, astronomers began... Uh, looking for exoplanets, they call them, planets around other nearby stars, they were amazed to find so many huge gas giant stars orbiting very close to their um, their parent star. Mm. And this is completely at odds with any idea of how our solar system formed and how our gas giants formed, because a gas giant is supposed to have accreted from material which was not blown out of the solar system. So in other words, you have light elements like hydrogen and helium should only uh, accumulate in the outer reaches of the solar system, and yet here we had stars nearby with gas giants orbiting in a matter of days, in some cases, around their parent star. Jeez. In other words, uh, there was a real problem for the standard theory. So once again, another ad hoc, um, out of the millions of ad hoc uh, ideas, was tossed into the pot, and that is that the gas giants must have... Um, somehow orbited in close to the star. In other words, they'd been formed way out in the distance mm -hmm. in the outer reaches of that stellar system and then migrated inwards. Why would it mi migrate, uh, do you think? That's a good question. Uh, why haven't ours migrated in? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's, it's just another ad hoc idea. And this is what you have to do when your basic uh, model is incorrect. Um, it's the same thing with uh, meteorites. Uh, or, sorry, the cometary material that they sampled recently, the Stardust mission, mm. and they found uh, minerals which were formed at high temperatures. Now, um, I had said long ago that uh, comets and uh, planets are born by expulsion from the cores of other bodies, in particularly gas giants, and uh, so they will have uh, high temperature minerals in them. In other words, they're part of a fully differentiated body when they're spat out. And the uh, comets and meteorites and other uh, bits of debris are merely uh, leftovers from the generation of a planet or a moon by another larger body. Once again, you come back to this biological overtone where um, larger bodies give birth to smaller ones. But in the plasma... Um, theory of the formation of stars, it's not gravitational accretion which creates stars, it's the same kind of thing you see in um, ball lightning where you have a powerful lightning strike which compresses the surrounding atmosphere into these uh, uh, bright beads and the current density gets to the